All right, everybody, welcome to Chris Reeves. I'm Chris Stefano, aka Chris Reed Stefano. With me, as always, Mike Cannon. And today, we are going to talk to you about everyone's favorite American holiday, Thanksgiving, told to you from the point of view of two white men. That's right. So, this is the correct version of history. Yes, it is, folks. The, it is the most American holiday. We got turkey. We got football. We got giving thanks. We got the Native Americans. I love it. This is the one time of year where I masturbate to Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> it also makes falling asleep publicly completely acceptable. Yeah, tryptophan. I will say we're going to talk to you all about how um, the pilgrims survived the new world, how they shared a meal just before they killed and stole American uh, Native Americans' land. We're going to talk about all that, but I just want to say as we start this that I think turkey is disgusting. After living on Staten Island and seeing the random turkeys walk up and down Highland Boulevard and other pedestrian streets eating deer shit with their disgusting gobble necks, the back of their necks look like skin cancer. And I <laughs> will never eat turkey again. I will eat turkey alternatives. I will eat other types of bird, but seriously, turkey you can suck my ass warts. <laughs> their skin is pulled so tight when you see them in the wild that it really, you you said it before, but it looks like prehistoric. You can see their connection to dinosaur. Yeah. They're so big, it feels like oh. you're kind of just putting a knife into a St. Bernard. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's, it, it is an off-putting animal. disgusting. It literally looks like I'm eating someone in a nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I watched a turkey in my mother-in-law's backyard just kind of casually hop a six-foot fence. Dude, when they start to fly, when turkeys start to fly, it's like prehistoric. Their wings are, so, it's disgusting, and I hate them. Yeah. But let's talk about this holiday, okay? So you had two cultures. You had, of course, the pilgrims, coming with the Native Americans, and it was the uh, first feast for the pilgrims in a year In a year, because half of the pilgrims died, and then, bless you, Vito, and <laughs> Vito's off camera sneezing, because he's, to be honest with you, every time he hears Native Americans, he sneezes. I keep telling him it's racist, but he says it's not. <laughs> the, the white man just gave him a blanket. Yes. <laughs> After the pilgrims, basically, uh, the pilgrims invited the Native Americans to their land. They had a nice little meal. And then they pulled a Judas and they started killing everybody. And now they eventually, and then they eventually took their land. And all this happened in what is now today known as Massachusetts. As, <laughs> or my cousin used to call it massive two shits. But I won't do that because I have shows there in Medford. But they're almost sold out. Chevalier Theater. So here's the thing. When we say the new world... We're really just talking about because white people, we got there, Christopher Columbus got there. Of course, the indigenous people, the Native Americans, which we call Indians because Columbus is a stupid asshole and he thought he was in India when he was really like in the Bahamas. That's, that's the first, he really was, he was in the Bahamas and he gets to the Bahamas and he's like, I'm in India. I'm sure of it. <laughs> that's like, like your map quest goes out, map quest. You go, you end up in Pennsylvania and you're like, look at this, yeah. China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What an idiot. And he thought and he saw um you know what's a fun fact about about Columbus when he got to the Bahamas, um he thought he was in India, he met these people there called the Armawark Indians and he was um fascinated with them because their culture, none of them had wives and all the women would all the women and the men were just for everybody and the kids were raised by this Native American village native bahamian village and they would i don't know what to say and they i'm trans and they put me in the algorithm and then and and then basically and then basically um you know the 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 that term it takes a village came from there because the babies were just raised by the um the babies were just raised by uh, all the other adults. And if a woman, oh, there were, you could have sex with as many people as you wanted. And if a woman had sex with a guy, mm -hmm. and then after she had sex with him and was impregnated by him, if she thought he was basically like a pussy and not worth her time, uh -huh. she would abort the baby with a concoction of herbs and spices, which we call <laughs> Mountain Dew today. <laughs> <laughs> Just a nice yellow dye number five. Yeah, tea. could you imagine though? That was like 
That was the way it worked back then. Dude, my entire life would be like, look at the lady I just knocked up and then her staring me in the eyes, measuring me up and just oozing out our baby. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, just taking a plan B from behind her ear like a cigarette and be like, you pussy. <laughs> she, she sees me throw a spear like a girl yeah, and is oh like, my. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. As you know, as I said, Colum you know, Columbus, look at for India. That's why he's called them. That's why they're called Indians because he thought he was in India. Um, now, Indian is not actually offensive, but it's just the people, the Native American people would rather be called by their tribe name. So that's why I just, I, this is why for me to just be respectful, anytime I see a Native American person, rather than call him an Indian, I just call them a Jeep Grand Cherokee. <laughs> and they seem to be better with that. <laughs> I always say from the land of Mohegan Sun. Yes. I greet you. I greet you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so now Columbus is often credited with opening the way for European exploration and contact with the Americas. So he was the first. See, that's the thing with history, right? Is the history that we learn is just from a European point of view. So everything began. America was discovered in 1492. It's like, no, America has been there for a billion years. Yeah. And quite a long time. When they, they, some of these Native American nations, I'm reading uh, a little bit about it now. When they got there, so, some of them had like, there was like 60 million people in the country. <laughs> Already? Like, and they were like, <laughs> we just discovered a new place. <laughs> and then, and so like all our history is post-1492. It's like there was literally like 60 million Native American tribes just, and we were like, we have an entire history. That's awesome. But we were like, no, 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 I can see your balls. <laughs> yeah, you must you guys, not know anything. You don't count. Yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine the absolute monster cock some of these Native American guys must have had? And a lot of extra skin, I would assume. Oh, my God. These guys' cocks must have looked like wigwams. So <laughs> Some real dangly lunch meat coming I off love the tip. It. Um, if I, I'm going to, in honor of Thanksgiving and the Native Americans, just for one day, I'm going to rename my penis Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So Columbus is, gets the credit, but this is like a Tesla Edison thing. Columbus gets the credit. Everyone knows Christopher Columbus. And here is a statue up in front. There is a statue of Christopher Columbus up in front of my house and it's staying. <laughs> <laughs> but I also have a statue of the real father of America, Amerigo Vespucci. Amerigo Vespucci. Because as you could tell in my earlier comedy, I thought I was Italian. <laughs> so Amerigo is who America is basically named after, Italian Bay. But he is the one that started to understand the geography of the New World, and he documented it in great depth during his voyages. So Really, Amerigo Vespucci should be the guy, but we give it to Christopher Columbus. He also won the long game, though. I mean, obviously, nobody knows. Nobody says Amerigo, but he's named America. America. All it's Christopher Columbus got was a small plot of land in Ohio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, that's brutal. The Capitol, shout out for the people who came out to the Joanne Davidson Theater of my show there last week. <laughs> James, Mad Dog Matter did better than me, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I just want to be clear, okay? And when I say I just want to be clear, I'm really talking to the algorithm. I just want to say that we are not recognizing Christopher Columbus or Amerigo Vespucci as heroes. No. <laughs> but, of course, we're not algorithm. Can the algorithm see or just hear? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it sees as much as scans. Scan, okay, yeah. You know? So they are not heroes. <laughs> we love Christopher Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci for finding the land. We really do. Not for what they did to the Native Americans, though. That was not good. And that is true. That That's was true. not good. So here's another fun fact. You ready for this? Here's what we're good at. We're great at conquering. We're great at pillaging. And we're great at spreading disease. That's right. Syphilis. 1,500 syphilis. Yummy, yummy in my tummy. <laughs> was absolutely everywhere in Europe. It was rampant, and we brought it to the New World, killing most of the Native Americans in the New World with disease and syphilis. Another fun fact is most of the Native Americans that died, it was disease that killed them. It wasn't necessarily war or famine. It was full disease because they had never experienced anything like that because I don't know why. They just they have, they have stronger immune systems. They and took... And we went in there and really took advantage of the community element of sexuality, huh? Yes, because so we were spreading it out, spreading it out because this whole idea of like even like private property 
to the Native Americans was like, what are you talking about? No, they all lived in big communes. There was a very um, egalitarian society. They all lived with each other. And so, and, and they're, they worked very clean. But Society then, was like tapas. They all took from dishes. Yes. They ate a little bit and passed it around. And then we came in with our European dirty dicks <laughs> and just literally destroyed. I mean, we inadvertently, I don't know that anybody meant to do it, but you did do it. Yeah. We set fire to them through their genitals. Yes. Here's the, here's the thing. After killing an estimated 10 million people during the late 15th century, syphilis had the doctors at the time so confused and so scared that they refused to even write its name and nobody wanted their country's name associated with this disease. So the Spanish were like, uh, no, you're not going to call it the Spanish disease. And the French were like, uh, yes, we are. We're going to call it the Spanish disease. And the Spanish called it Napoleon disease or Napoleon disease. And the Germans called it Dutch disease and so on and so forth. So every other country was calling whatever their enemies were. They were calling it the disease. Me and Mike, guess what we're calling it? The Democrats disease. <laughs> <laughs> Vito just left. No. <laughs> Isn't it incredible that we're still doing the exact same thing? We're yeah. calling it the China virus. Yeah, the China <laughs> virus immediately, dude. The Spanish flu. None of this shit is true. It's the exact same. We're just putting it on whoever. Yeah. <laughs> See, that sex conquers all. This whole idea of when you read about history, oh, they call these groups savages, this group was dirty. None of that was true. They're all having sex with each other. None, yeah. This is all whitewashed history stuff to make different groups to create war and money and it's the whole thing. It's like, it's all the rich getting richer. We're going to get to that in another episode of Chris Stories. <laughs> so, the pilgrims. Who are they? Well, they were the original protesters. They didn't have blue hair and signs and weren't, didn't look like lesbians, whether they were male or female, but they were the original protesters. And um, the Church of England, what do you know about the Church of England, Mike? I know nothing about the Church of England, actually. Nothing? Not a single thing. There, dude, there was pure disappointment in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Christeries. <laughs> Where one of the colos is a moron. Yeah, let me teach you. So in the late... <laughs> Uh, fit, we should do a thing where I teach you a history topic that you've never uh, learned that, before. And right. I'll, let's call it the rollup. <laughs> yeah, the, the scallop. The scallop. <laughs> Break to our show, the scallop. Or a little dash. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so, um, okay. So basically the Church of England was founded by King Henry VIII um, in the 1530s. Basically, he wanted to like the Pope and the Catholic church wouldn't let him divorce. So he was like, well, I'm just going to make my own religion then. Nice. You assholes. I like that little yeah. L Ron Hubbard style. So Henry King Henry VIII, what he did was he retained elements of both the Catholic tradition and the Protestant uh, theology. And he made the church of England and the church of England, I think is the most prevalent church in England right now. It's definitely still being practiced. It might be bigger than Catholicism. The church of England might be the number one, uh, Religion of the British. So by the 1600s, this group, the Church of England, were known as the English separatists, a.k.a. the future pilgrims. And they hated how corrupt everyone was. And they kind of were like mad about religion. They didn't like this religion um, anymore. And they claimed too many Catholic practices and traditions. They were like, this is just, we are leaving. They basically like, we don't want to practice anymore. We don't want to do this religion anymore. We're out of here. So um, it wasn't a requirement for the Church of England to live in England, but it was expected that you had to adhere to like religious norms and the queen's authority and all that. And the state of religion was expected. And those who did not conform, those basically who didn't fall in line, you were tortured. You were tortured. You were beat up. You were thrown in jail. It was like really, really not good back then. So all you people that bitch about how bad America is, why don't you go to 16th century Church of England, England, you fucking pussies. <laughs> Church of England, England. <laughs> Isn't that kind of something, though, is now like we do act as though we're under authoritarian rule. And yeah. to an extent, that's true. But like real authoritarian rule used to come with an iron fist to your face. They would put you on. If you didn't practice their religion, they would put you on a wheel and turn you until your bones broke. Yeah. They'd uh, stretch your joints from each other. Yeah, dude. And we're not talking about like hot yoga. Um so in 1607, the Protestants broke away from the Church of England. They just broke away. They said, we're doing our own thing. And then they first go to Holland 
because Holland's very religious. You know, they they tolerate a lot of religion. They go to the freaky deaky Dutch with their wooden shoes. Um, they stay there for about 12 years and then they run out of money because who, you know, that's the thing with Holland. It's like, you can't pay for everything with loaves of bread and Heineken's. <laughs> um, so they stay there for 12 years. Then they get a nice, just a sweet little offer from the English merchants who will give them money to sail to the new world and settle down. It does seem too, too good to be true at the time, but the merchants, they shared the same religious ideas as the pilgrims. And they thought of this, the pilgrims thought of this as like an opportunity for us and for them. So they go to the new world and they're like, the pilgrims like, we're gonna get total freedom in this new world. Um, they sail to the new world on what boat? The Nina. <laughs> That's one of my kids' names. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> nope, the Mayflower. That's right. Yes. Christopher Columbus was on the Nina Pizza That's and the Santa right. Maria, and the Pilgrims are on the Mayflower. I'm sorry, you caught me completely in a tangential <laughs> thought, yes. thought bubble. <laughs> it was uh, the Mayflower, What it was a cargo used in the wine trade. Um, there were 102 Pilgrims on it, and they were aiming for Virginia, but the rough winds brought them to Cape Cod. Cape Cod, Massachusetts, kid. <laughs> they were supposed to go to Virginia, and they said, what? Fucking couple of fucking lobsters. Yo, look at these fucking pilgrims kid the cocksuckers <laughs> um so here's the thing the pilgrims a lot of people know they got to cape cod and where do you, where do we always hear that they landed from denzel washington oh. we didn't land on plymouth, plymouth rock damn it you really i almost had it go if ahead, you gave me a half a second go plymouth ahead, do rock it. do it do it oh. you're an actor i didn't land on did he say i or we we didn't, i think it's we didn't land on plymouth rock plymouth rock landed on me that's it baby the equalizer <laughs> so they first anchored in Provincetown Harbor. Yes, P Town. Yes, oh, the gate. Nice. Yeah, of course those those little pilgrims got to Provincetown. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They were given fruity drinks and you, beads yeah, as soon you, as they, they arrived. Off the Mayflower, they're like, "What's up?" Yeah, that would be so funny. Like if in Provincetown Harbor, like the Native Americans there, which is the gay ones. Yeah, just they, feather boas like, just coming out, like with the little rainbow. Like they all have like little <laughs> rainbow teepee houses. They're like, "Work, bitch, work." <laughs> They're like, do you have buckles on your shoes? Yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And they were like, no, 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 all right, Z Biotics, the pre-alcohol probiotic, your first drink of the night for a better tomorrow, engineered by a team of PhD microbiologists. Z Biotics is a probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is responsible for rough mornings after drinking. Step one, have a Z Biotics. For best results, make Z Biotics your first drink of the night. Step two, drink responsibly. Pace yourself, hydrate, get a good night's sleep. Step three, enjoy tomorrow. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Z Biotics pre alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works when you drink alcohol, gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Z-Biotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it most. Just remember to drink Z-Biotics before drinking alcohol. Drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep. You will feel your best tomorrow. So right now, we are going to give you a, a, a sweet discount here for listening to Chris Therese. If you go to z biotics.com slash Christeries. You will get 15% off your first order when you use Christeries at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code Christeries so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. If you're unsatisfied for any reason, they will refund you your money. No questions asked. Remember, to head to zbiotics.com slash Christeries and use the code Christeries at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Here we go. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports. It is the biggest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Prize picks, prize picks, prize picks. With the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league, the one that me and Mike Cannon are in, a league created specifically for combo projections 
projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three points made plus receptions. You want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz? You can now find community players under the promos tabs of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community. Each week, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players get injured. For football and basketball, games if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second that player is rebooted prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports pl- platform with an injury insurance policy so right now you guys will get a nice discount where you go to prizepicks.com slash Christeries and use the code Christeries for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash Christeries. Use the code Christeries for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. This episode sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, do you remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and extra confidence in the bed. Listen up. Here's how you do it. BlueChew.com. It's a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew tablets made right here in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package, but there's nothing discreet about your monster boner. We have got a nice special deal for you because Blue Chew wants you to have better sex. They want you to discover your options at BlueChew.com. They want you to chew it and do it, and that's what I want, and I want to see picks. The special deal for our listeners, you can try Blue Chew for free when you use the promo code Christeries at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com, promo code Christeries to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information, and we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. So they get there around November 11, 1620 um, to Provincetown Harbor, not Plymouth Rock. Um, now, the Pilgrims, they when they came, they arrived in Plymouth. You know, they, they get to Provincetown Harbor, November 11, 1620. They get to Plymouth. Eventually, they do get there in about late November. <laughs> and that is the New England winter. Okay, especially back then before global warming. Oh, global warming. It's not real. <laughs> so global warming. Allegedly. <laughs> It was cold in that uh, in late November, New England. It's very cold there. They had a diff, very difficult ocean journey, and they faced a significant delay in the plans that left them with less time to establish proper winter preparations. And they're from southern England, so they are just not used to this northeast bitter ass winter. Dude, just wet, cold clothes oh, all the time. It's so. And I do think quickly. I think Bill Burr said this. I think that's why people from New England are very, very funny people because they're so angry. Yeah, just getting hit with the rainwater, hit with the snow. I'm pretty sure Bill Burr. Has has a bit about that i think so it's too, very yeah. true but it's yeah it's the patience for your surroundings yes. is just at an all-time low yes so basically this you know they they have what are they going to do um the first winter didn't go well half of them died so half of the the pilgrims died because they just couldn't face the winter i mean think about you know think about me i'll i'll die if my air conditioner you know <laughs> yeah. i'll die if my humidifier get doesn't work i really i, I just put myself there because could you imagine looking at your friend who you've done this whole voyage with this crazy travel to a brand new place and then you have to watch them shiver to death yeah like you're just literally watching them chatter just, until yeah, into an and early have, demise and then you're forced with the decision like should i eat him <laughs> um okay could you would you i would easier than a turkey I, I swear to God, I could eat you before I could eat a turkey. Yeah. You got a nice fat butt. <laughs> <laughs> the pilgrims, then they set up a colony, which they, everyone thinks is the first colony, but that's a lie. Survey says, that's a lie. The first colony was the Roanoke colony, a.k.a. the Lost Colony. They do a lot of shows about this one. It's very fascinating, which was established in 1585 and then Jamestown in 1607. I smell more Christy episodes. <laughs> So Plymouth Colony, though, was actually a pretty dope place to live. If you could make it through the winter, the summers were gorgeous. (laughs) (laughs) But the winters, like any type of old school colonial winter before they had heating systems, had to just absolutely suck. Yeah, I can't imagine just shivering my balls off and trying to get a fire started every morning. No, thanks. I couldn't do it. Yeah, I would have a fire because I would have active syphilis. (laughs) Um, so I would just <laughs> urinate in a bucket and then just like piss on a log and yeah, it like kids, keeps your family warm. We don't have jackets this year, but daddy does have hot piss <laughs> from your mother. <laughs> the colony had seven houses. 
They had a meeting house. They had structures for food and storage. And then they go out for resources and they encounter our friends, the Wampanoags. Hmm. The Wampanoag. Um, Was the, that an Italian tribe? Yes. <laughs> the Wampanoags. The Wampanoags or the Wampanoags. <laughs> and the Wampanoags or Wampanoags have been in the region for 12,000 years. So when we say new world, we really are idiots when we call this the new world. When this, they, they have been there for 12,000 years. And they obviously weren't happy to see the new settlers, and they weren't impressed. They were like, look at these idiots. They're all shivering to death. A lot of There's a lot of accounts of Native Americans just laughing at the settlers as they're dying, because they're like, you're dumb. Yeah, well, and also the, to have the arrogance to probably come over and not even try to like ask their new neighbors for help, yeah. more or less, you know, with how we are would bully a newcomer yeah. like oh what are you doing here yeah. in this place we just found yeah yeah <laughs> and so there's they didn't ingratiate themselves i forgot which tribe it was but i, I saw one thing in one of these history books i'm reading where like the native americans like they're telling the story like from a few years later like the europeans went up to them with their armor and their guns they're like we're better than you we have guns like that's yeah. pretty much what they said and they were like okay plant corn the native americans were like plant corn like yeah. we could do it with our guns <laughs> and then they didn't come back they just let them be and then they came back the next year and like 90 percent of them were dead like just in their armor dead oh they couldn't God. eat anything Dude, so this is it's it's kind of funny that this is the that this is how our our country was established because we have a big thing with assimilation now and how certain cultures don't even make an attempt right. to assimilate into the established culture of the country. That's literally what we did to establish this place. Yeah, we showed up. There was a whole order of things established, and we were like, "That's gay. We're gonna do it a totally different way. <laughs> we're doing it our way. You guys want hot dogs? Yeah, we're gonna kill you off." But here's one Wampanoag, one of the main Wampanoags, the one that you've probably heard of, Squanto, whose real name was Tisquantum. Tisquantum, aka he who gathers, that's what mm. it translates into, learned English, and he encountered other settlers in the last five years. So Squanto was known because he's the one that could speak English. And Tisquantum Squ physics? Tisquanto physics. I like that. <laughs> Squanto. He sang that thong, 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 thong. <laughs> But, he, but, but, that, but that Squanto sang. Um, what did he? What, what, what would they be wearing? What, 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 would, what would they be wearing? <laughs> Not loincloth. Yeah, that loincloth. <laughs> cloth, 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 cloth. <laughs> like when you be girls. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Squanto shows the settlers. He showed them, could these arrogant people, how to harvest corn by putting fish in the soil to fertilize it. Ooh, there's a tip you don't see on Instagram. <laughs> I'll buy your cookbook. <laughs> How do you harvest corn by putting fish oil fish in the soil to fertilize it? Teach he taught them how to fish, how to hunt, and how to farm tailored to the seasons, which is the name of Taylor Tomlinson's new special. <laughs> tailored to the seasons. <laughs> Offered protection from other tribes. Shout out Taylor Tomlinson for her new show on CBS. I like just shouting that out, just buried in a Christie's episode. <laughs> but shout her out. That's a pretty cool thing. So finally. After 20 minutes into this video, we finally get to the true story of Thanksgiving. So the newcomers, the pilgrims, they're doing actually well. They're hunting. They, got, they took Squanto's advice. They're barely raping. They're having a good time. So they were like, you know what? It's fall 1621. Let's celebrate the harvest by having a big feast. Everybody wanted to eat. So they go and they gather then all the new food that they have, that freshly grown food. They hunt some game. They got all these different animals. And the Wampanoags, they hear gunshots and they think this has to be war. So they start putting on their war paint. They sacrifice a few kids, you know. <laughs> they get ready. <laughs> you know, Indian shit. So leader Masalt gathers 90 men, biological men, to investigate. Although I will say, and we will do a Christmas on this, Native Americans were big with dual spirits. Yeah, the, two spirits. They were all trans. A yeah. lot of them, like they, there was no, a lot of things that we think are progressive, people were doing hundreds and hundreds of years yeah, ago. it's been established. It's been like that, dude. In Roman society, everybody was gay. There were, people were banging animals a thousand years ago. That's, so you know, that's actually funny. Trans people are more traditionalist than like leave it to beaver. Exactly, yeah. But you still ain't reading my kids' books in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, basically, the the Wampanoags they hear gunshots and they think that it's it's war. So the leader Masoy gathers ninety men to investigate. But they found out that the settlers are actually getting ready to feast. They don't want a war. They want to eat, baby. 
So Masal tells them that they will hunt you and feast as well. They join together. They join forces. And then they basically start to, they, they all um, are included in this big major feast. You had 91 Wampanoags and 53 settlers, 53 pilgrims. Um, and this was not like a regular Thanksgiving dinner like we celebrate today. This was not just a few hours at your grandma's house. This was three days. Some people actually say seven days, but this was three days of just eating, just eating food and hanging out. The menu, we had turkey, gross, Indian <laughs> corn, yas, pumpkins, yas, chestnuts, yas, eels, gross, goose, Ugh. Dude, did it take a white woman to introduce pumpkin spice to the Wampanoags? Probably did. That's yeah. fucking great. Yeah. Just hot <laughs> pumpkin spice. Yeah, they're like, hey, boys. What about that? <laughs> Eels, goose, duck, onions, radishes, venison, which is deer meat, cod, uh, bass, uh, lobster, clams, mussels, cornmeal, corn porridge, beans. And then they set, the settlers probably seasoned all these dishes with cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg, salt, pepper, and dried fruits. It actually sounds delicious. That sounds awesome and also must have been a pure attack on white people's taste buds. Oh, my like God. Their first time with spice or seasoning, they must have thought there was a true fucking party. I would love to see if we could measure the amount of blood in the settler's shit the days after this. <laughs> Oh, the Wampanoags introduced maple syrup. Oh. I like them. Yeah, you're a Wampanoag guy. I realize that I'm realizing right now that I have a diet. I have a Wampanoag diet. That's what I'm on. I'm on the Wampanoag diet. The Plymouth colonists certainly um, did not serve potatoes. By the way, they didn't have potatoes. They weren't available to them at the time. So ever interjected potatoes? That was that came later on. Which again, reading through all this history, so much of the stuff that we learn was just interjected into the story that's taught to us as school children, like fifty years actually after the event actually happened. Yeah, it's like so many things. Like, and again, we'll do a Chris Reese on this, but like Patrick Henry, "Give me liberty or give me death." Mm -hmm. It's like a famous speech. Never said it. Somebody just made that up fifty years later to sell a book about Patrick. Henry. It worked. Scumbags. It fucking worked. It worked, dude. Um, <laughs> so the entertainment, they played games, Blind Man's Bluff, which is our Marco Polo, target shooting, pin games for the kids, dancing, singing. They had a good time. That sounds fun. Yeah. Nobody was on their cell phones, you see? <laughs> yeah, they were living in the moment. Yeah. There are thoughts that this continued to be a tradition, but then the drought stopped them. So the first religious Thanksgiving, um, the one that we are very familiar with today, the giving thanks, actually happened two years later in 1623 after a two-month drought cleared. So the first one, this one that, you know, uh, like kicked it all off, 1621, then there was a drought for two years, and the one that we celebrate, 1623. Wow. They had like a pandemic break. Yeah. Like we did. Yeah, which I should have done on my tour because <laughs> I've oversaturated the market. <laughs> So how do we know about Thanksgiving? Well, Edward Winslow, no relation to Carl, was one of the first English pilgrims, was one of the English pilgrims in the feast, um, actually was there, and he wrote letters that it survived all the historical events of the Plymouth Colony. And then this guy, William Bradford, who was Plymouth's first governor, wrote a manuscript about it. Back at that time, he wrote a manuscript. But then during the Revolutionary War, the British stole this manuscript and it was only recovered again in the 1850s, some 75 years after the Revolutionary War, just in time for the magazine editor, Sarah Josepha Hale, to incorporate it into her campaign to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. So you see, even it wasn't the holiday as we celebrate it today till 200 years after the event actually happened. There's so many things in history that are like that. It's crazy. Isn't it that nuts? It, it's, it, you, you see why history isn't all that accurate. It's because of how long it takes to get a full story. Right. Like all those different parts that they had to kind of gather, the letters, the this, the that, put it together to get even close to a 360 view which still falls short yeah it's insane and now you know every news article is trying to beat everybody to everything so yeah, that's stupid. why I can't even can't nothing's believe true anybody nothing's true nothing's true so she did not remember the 1623 one and only shouted out the 1621 harvest thanksgiving as thanksgiving in the magazine um so she wanted this to be the national holiday, which, of course, she succeeded. She saw it as national unity. Um, she saw it as a way to unify the country and strengthen the sense of American identity. Historical heritage preserved and celebrated the historical event of the first Thanksgiving as part of American heritage. Family values. She promoted Thanksgiving as a time for families to come together, emphasize family bonds and gratitude. Social reform. Uh, a holiday could encourage moral improvement and charitable acts like uh, you know, fostering positive social change. 
and the editorial influence as editor of Gotti's uh, Ladies Book. She used her platform to advocate for Thanksgiving and its traditions. Um, and then her efforts led to Thanksgiving becoming a national holiday in 1863. So that's the thing: is you think it's a, it was a it was a holiday 200 years after stuff happened. Just like I believe 200 years from now, we will celebrate the inauguration of 2016 President <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> But has there been more staying power for somebody to a stat like she all of those things that she wanted to accomplish? That is what the holiday is. It is. It still works around all of that. Yeah. Unless you're on TikTok, then all you just hear is all the negative stuff. <laughs> yeah. How did it go mainstream? Like anything else, my man, good old Abe Lincoln. 1863, Abraham Lincoln agreed to make Thanksgiving a national holiday after reading um, the book by Sarah, uh, Sarah Josepha Hale. I, but she li He listened to her. He listened to that little lady with her little woman brain. And he said, you can have a holiday, honey. Uh, <laughs> patted her on the pat head. Patted her on the head. And he wanted to promote unity. Why did he want to promote unity? Because we're right in the middle of the Civil War. So he wants the states to get unified over something. So he's like, maybe Thanksgiving will distract them from the slaves. Um, so, of course, that didn't work. It didn't. Civil War went on for another two years. <laughs> because who was serving the meals? Exacto mundo. <laughs> <laughs> so so glad we could come together. Now fetch me some more cranberry sauce. Oh, I'm Mars. <laughs> so he wanted to have this unifying holiday. So he established this tradition of Thanksgiving celebrations every year on the third Thursday in November. Why the third Thursday in November, you may ask? Because it fell at harvest. It didn't really interrupt the work week that much. And it was a good day for football. <laughs> so in closing... I want to shout out Squanto. Thank you for teaching the whites how to harvest land That's with right. your old fishes. Squanty, you, uh, Squant, Squanty, I appreciate you. As white people, we we would have nothing without you. You taught us everything we know. Um, shout out venison, maple syrup, and honestly, the driest meat and most disgusting meat I've ever had. Turkey. It is disgusting. I hate you, but I will allow it to be shouted out during the specific Thanksgiving episode. But to be honest with you, even maple syrup couldn't save turkey for me. I hate it. I don't want to eat it. Mom, if you're listening, make me something else. I want pizza from Joe and John's. Shout out the grade school version of Thanksgiving that we've been taught where the Indians, a.k.a. the Native Americans and the settlers got along. But obviously that didn't last too long. We started fighting and killing each other. What can you do? Shout out the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Shout out turkey pardoning. And most of all, shout out Black Friday because you know how much I love black people. Gobble, gobble, babes. <laughs> and remember, yesterday was history.